important themes. Uh, I think we can get at what his major concern is um, and what really the basis of at least all of this work is if we just look at the account of the creation on page 1077. So if I can get a volunteer when you get there to just start reading. Before the seeds and lands had been created, before the sky that covers everything, nature displayed a single aspect only throughout the cosmos. Chaos was its name, a shapeless, unwrought mass of inert folk, and nothing more. With the discordant seeds of disconnected elements all heaped together in anarchy. Okay. You can stop there, Daisha. Thank you. So what is, for Ovid, the first thing that exists? Chaos. Chaos. Yep. And what does he mean by chaos? What is he talking about? Just a dark, blank place. Mm, is it a dark, blank place? Is it a void like it was, say, for Hesiod and the Theogony? Well, it has elements, but they're all disconjoined. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like this great, big, amorphous mass, right? Where nothing is stable. Nothing stays the same. It's just constantly shifting, constantly changing, right? So this is a little bit different from most of the creation myths we've looked at thus far, right? If we look, for example, at the Genesis story, if we look at the Enuma Elish, what's the first thing that exists in those? The gods. Actually, not the gods, at least not in the Enuma Elish. Was it water? Water, mm -hmm. yeah. Water in both of those is the kind of primordial element that comes before anything else, right? You know, there's the, the passage in Genesis about the face of God passing over the waters, right? So the water is already there when the creation process starts. Here, all that we have is chaos. Can I get somebody else to continue reading? Yeah, Corey, go for it. The sun as yet did not light up the earth, nor did the crescent moon renew her horns, nor was the earth suspended in midair, balanced by her own weight, nor did the ocean extend her arms to the margins of the land. Although the land and sea and air were present, land was unstable, the sea unfit for swimming, the air lacked light, shape shifted constantly, and all things were at odds with one another. For in a single mass, the cold strove with warmth, wet was supposed to dry and soft to hard, and weightlessness to matter have weight. Okay, thank you. So the big problem here, right, is that nothing holds together for very long, right? All of the necessary elements of life are present, but they turn into something else within moments, right? So can I get somebody to continue reading it, Some God or Kinder Nature? Some God or Kinder Thank Nature. Thank you, Ashley. Settled this dispute by separating earth from heaven, and then by separating sea from earth, and fluid aether from the denser air. And after these were separated out and liberated from the primal heat, he bound the disentangled elements, each in its place, and all in harmony. Thank you. So which God did this? Yeah, unspecified, right? Some God or a kinder nature, right? So why does it matter that he doesn't specify which God did this? That way it'd be like available. There's no specific. You first, then you. I think it's so be like widely available to like different like people because maybe some others like favor gods. One certain god above other gods. Okay, and, and what were you going to say, Corey? And I was saying that, like, that there wasn't like a ruler of the gods. It was just kind of like god of this, god of that, did mm -hmm. this and that. Well, the the gods do have. Well, I guess they they wouldn't have set up their hierarchy yet at this point, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Zeus is the king of, or Jupiter is the king of the Roman gods. He's the equivalent of Zeus in um, Greek mythology. They're both sky gods, um, but. Might there be actually sort of a simpler reason why he doesn't name a god here? Yeah, Chris. Because it's irrelevant to his purpose. Yeah. It doesn't fucking matter, right? <laughs> That's his basic argument here, is that it doesn't really matter which god did this. He doesn't care. So we see here, sort of in general, Ovid's attitude towards the gods, right, is kind of flippant. He's kind of irreverent. Um, not quite in the same way that Euripides was, right? Euripides sort of showed the gods arbitrarily favoring their relatives, um, things of that nature. Um, 
Ovid also shows the gods behaving badly, often very badly. But much of the, beha the bad behavior of the gods in the Metamorphoses is bad sexual behavior, right? Forcing themselves on mortals and then not sticking around to deal with the consequences. Um, <clears throat> now, one other thing that's important to think about here, right? If a god had to come in and bind all of the disparate elements of chaos into harmony, what does this suggest about that harmony? It can be broken apart. Yeah, it's artificial, right? And it can be broken. So if everything is ultimately made out of chaos, what does that mean about everything in the world? Pardon? I think that's how it starts. Okay, yeah, it's, we start with chaos. We start with change, right? And because we're made out of chaos, everything in this room, according to Ovid, is made out of chaos. It's inherently unstable. Everything can lose its form. Now, when you guys were doing your presentation, you talked about... Um, Augustus as a conservative and Ovid as a progressive. Um, these two might not have actually seen their positions in quite that way. Um, Ovid believed himself to be standing up for more traditional Roman values. In fact, Augustus, when he became emperor, like he, there was a pre-existing Roman empire, right? The city of Rome, which had been a republic ruled by a senate, uh, not a democratic body, more like an oligarchy, right? A bunch of rich guys um, hanging out together, making rules for everybody else. Um, but yeah, they, had, they already ruled an empire. But no one had ever taken the title of imperator, emperor, before Augustus, right? So Augustus becomes the single ruler, takes the title of emperor, and essentially renders the Senate pretty much irrelevant. Doesn't disband it, but doesn't really care what they think. Now, what Augustus is primarily interested in, right, has to do with the way he came to power. Now, you guys touched on this a little bit, right, but does anybody know what happened in Rome that allowed Augustus to come to power in the first place? Assassination of Julius Caesar. Okay, assassination of Julius Caesar, but that wasn't even the beginning of it. Right? Does anybody know why Julius Caesar was assassinated? Was it a coup? Were they all sort of. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Caesar had been elected what was called consul. And oh, great, markers are running out again. Wonderful. So Caesar was elected consul along with two other guys. Triumvirate, yep. Guys, Pompey and Marcus Licinius Crassus. So Caesar and Pompey together turn on Crassus. And then Caesar and Pompey turn on each other. Pompey is killed in Egypt. So Caesar becomes sole consul, sole leader, sole leader of Rome, and declares a state of emergency and declares himself dictator, which a Roman consul had the right to do in times of emergency. A group of senators, led by Caius Cassius and Marcus Brutus, believed that Caesar was setting himself up to become sole hereditary ruler of Rome. And, they, and so they, pardon? They had, they had just gotten out of a monarchy, hadn't they? And they didn't want to go back. There had been a monarchy um, in Rome's distant past, right? There had been a series of kings who had been brutal tyrants and, and had been driven out. Yeah, they, exactly. They did, not, they did not want to return to a monarchy. So the conspirators kill Caesar. Caesar's allies, Mark Antony, 
and his nephew, Octavian, then go to war against these rogue senators. They defeat the rogue senators, and then they turn on each other. Right? Are we seeing a pattern here? So finally, Octavian is the last man standing, changes his name to Augustus, becomes emperor of Rome. So his program for Roman life, for Roman politics, after his victory, is one of stability. Right? He wants everything to just be the same for a while, right? Which is understandable when you have you know, been through several decades of civil war. Octavian is the son of the uh, Octavian was Caesar's great nephew, was Julius Caesar's great nephew, and his adopted son. Caesar didn't have any biological sons. So, Augustus promotes a set of values that he claims are traditional Roman values, but would in fact add up to a kind of invented tradition, right? This wasn't really the way Romans were living prior to the Augustan age. So, one idea that he adopts from the Greeks Right, is the idea of the oikos. Right? The single family household is building block of the nation, but he, do, but he calls it, of course, by its Latin name, domus. So the domus becomes the central organizing unit for Roman society, the patriarchal family. And Rome is supposed to operate like a patriarchal family with the emperor as father. Right, so Augustus is picturing himself as father to the nation. Now, alongside this, he promotes the values of chastity Right, that people should be in monogamous relationships within you know, a single family. Um, this was actually largely in defiance of more traditional Roman sexual attitudes, which tended to be a lot looser. And in fact, continued to be looser um, right under Augustus's nose. Um, his own daughter uh, conducted several extramarital affairs. Right? She actually, she preferred to conduct her affairs while pregnant because then it was less easy to detect. And then she was banished. What's that? Then she was banished. Oh, she was, she, yeah. Not, not her. <laughs> but uh, Ovid saw something or knew something about her. And that may have been part of what got him banished. But I'm not sure that that's, that's the story that's sometimes told, but I'm not sure it's actually accurate. We'll get to that in a minute. But yeah, so chastity was one value. Respect for the gods was another. And finally, and probably most importantly, was a value that in Latin was called pietas, which kind of loosely translates to our word piety, but doesn't mean the, quite the same thing, right? Pietas is a kind of duty to past generations and to the future. And it's symbolized in the figure of the preferred hero of the Augustan age. Um, the poet Virgil wrote a long poem called the Aeneid. Um, Virgil is, a, is an early contemporary of Ovid. He's an older poet and much more in line with Augustan values. Um, the Aeneid tells the story of a Trojan prince named Aeneas. Right? He and his men are the last survivors of the Greek siege at Troy. 
So they get on a ship. They travel to Italy. They take over some territory and eventually found a city that will provide the basis for Roman, for later Roman society, right? So the things that the Aeneid emphasizes are a continuity of civilizations, right? First, that Rome is not a new thing, right? That Rome is in fact the continuation of an earlier civilization that was cruelly and rudely interrupted by war, right? So they're giving themselves a more ancient pedigree. This is another uh, typical Augustan idea, the idea of eternal Rome, right? That Rome has always been and will always be as long as its people remain true to its values. And those values are what the emperor says they are, damn it. Now, Aeneas, the hero of this epic, is usually depicted, right, as a man of his prime. I, as you know, my artistic skills are lacking, so <laughs> we're just gonna go with stick figures, right? He's usually um, depicted as a man of, a man of his prime, carrying his aged, crippled father on his shoulders, and leading by the hand his young son, right? So he is the man who is both taking care of his father, taking care of the older generation, and leading the new generation into the future, right? And in fact, one of the, ma one of the major points of the Aeneid is one, Aeneas never does what he wants to do. He always does what the gods tell him to do. For example, he lands on the coast of North Africa and falls in love with a princess there early in the epic, and the gods tell him, no, it is your duty and your destiny to go to Italy and refound your society there. You can't stay here with this woman you love. And so Aeneas, driven by duty rather than by seeking personal pleasure, Goes. Are you talking about Aeneas now? Aeneas, yeah. Okay. We're just set, setting this up by way of comparison. Right. <clears throat> so the thing that drives Aeneas, right, Aeneas knows that he won't live to see the founding of this great kingdom. He'll die before it happens. But his son will carry on the work and he has to make sure that he gets to the place where his son will be positioned to meet his own destiny, right? So it's responsibility to the gods, respons responsibility to parents, responsibility to your children that is supposed to drive a Roman citizen in this age. Now in the Metamorphoses, what drives people? Yeah, pretty much their loins, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, people are... Ovid presents people as driven primarily by sexual desire. And this is one thing yeah, I'm glad you guys actually brought up, that by far the most important god in the Metamorphoses is Cupid, right? Cupid being the god who kindles sexual desire. So let's look for a second just to see how powerful Cupid is depicted as being at the beginning of the Apollo and Daphne uh, tale on page 1079. So um, can I get a volunteer to start reading? Someone who hasn't read yet. Yeah, go ahead. Daphne, the daughter of the river god, Penis. Penius. It's Penius. <laughs> Penius was the first love of Apollo. This happened not by chance, but by the cruel outrage of Cupid. Mm -hmm. Phoebus, in the triumph of his great victory against the Python, observed him bending back his bow and said, What are you doing with such manly arms? Which, how do you pronounce Lascivious. That? Lascivious boy. That bow benefits our brawn, wherewith we deal, without, we deal out wounds 
to Savage Beasts and other mortal foes unerringly just now with our innumerable arrows. We managed to lay low the mighty python whose pestilential belly covered acres. Content yourself with kindling love affairs with, with your wee torch and don't claim our glory. The son of Venus answered him with this. Your arrow, Phoebus, may strike everything. Mine will strike you as animals to gods. Your glory is so much less than mine. All right, thank you. You can stop there. All right, so Apollo is the god of what? The uh, sun. He's not actually the god of the sun. Helios, or in Latin, Sol, is the actual sun, right? The guy who drives his chariot down to pick up Medea and take her away, right? Because he's her grandfather. Apollo is the god of something, though, that is related to the sun. What does the sun give off? Light. And he is also, thus, related, um, the god of qualities that are related to light, or that are metaphorically related to light um, in Greek and Roman culture. Most especially, reason. Right? He is the god of logic, reason, rationality. Right? He talks about going out and slaying savage beasts with his bow and arrows. Right? That's civilization building activity. Right? I kill the savage monster, the python, so that you know, we can then you know, build cities and temples and oracles and all that fun shit um, in the wilderness that this creature once occupied. And he mocks Cupid's little bow and his wee torch that kindles desire, right? And which god turns out to be the more powerful? Cupid. Yeah. Cupid can, act, can make Apollo do whatever the hell he wants by firing the right arrow into his breast, right? And he proves this by firing the leaden arrow that causes lack of affection at the beautiful nymph Daphne, and the golden arrow that causes sexual desire at Apollo, which causes the god of reason, pardon? Yeah, to act in ways that, are, that we would not regard as rational, right? To continue to chase after this unfortunate woman who just just wants him to leave her the hell alone. Yeah, Corey. Is this the one that turns herself into a tree to get away from him? She gets turned into a tree to get away from him, yeah. And there's something creepy about the way this ends as well, right? Where he's kind of fondling the bark. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like you're on a tree for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't that in Hercules too? I, I don't know. It's another story too. Yeah. Right? The last story basically. Right, the, the, the Jovanio story, yeah. Um, that she he turns her into a lot. Yeah, and one thing you'll notice about it, we, we see constantly one story segueing into another, right? It's like um, sketch comedy shows actually do this a lot too. Right? How many of you have ever watched like an old Monty Python episode? Okay, yeah, it's, it's like you notice like how like one skit won't really end, it'll just kind of bleed into another. Ovid does the same sort of thing, right? This is actually an ancient technique. People have been doing this for a very, very long time. Um, so. The basic point here, right, is that love and lust override reason and bring out that chaos that resides still within all beings, right? Because we are all made of chaos, even the gods, everything's constructed out of that primordial chaos. It doesn't take too much to bring that back out and make people act nuts. And yet there are sometimes, it seems, punishments for uh, defying the natural order of things. Uh, let's shift over to near the end of what we had to read here, to the Pygmalion story. Uh, page 1104. Can I get a volunteer to start reading 
about Pygmalion. Chris, go for it. Pygmalion has observed how these women live lives of sordid indecency and dismayed by the numerous defects of character and nature that have given the feminine spirit. Stayed as a bachelor having no female companion. During that time, he created an ivory mm -hmm. statue, a work of most marvelous art, and gave it a figure better than any living woman could boast of, and promptly conceived the pattern for his own creation. You would have thought it alive, so like a real maiden, that its only natural modesty kept it from moving. Art concealed artfulness. McManion gazed in amazement, burning with love for what was likeness in his body. Often he stretched forth mm -hmm. and touched his creation, attempting to settle the issue. Was it a body or was it? This he would not yet conceive. A mere statue, he gives it kisses and there in return. He imagines how he addresses and how he caresses it, feeling his fingers sink into the warm pliant flesh, and fears he will have leave blue bruises all over his body. He seeks to win its affections with words and the presence, pleasing to girls such as seashells and pebbles, tame birds, armloads of flowers and thousands of different colors, lilies, bright painted balls, curious insects and amber. He dresses up, puts diamond rings on his fingers, gives us a necklace, a lazy, brazier, and pure, and pearl earrings. And even though all such adornment truly become her, she does not seem to be any less beautiful than you. He lays her down on a bed with a bright purple cover and calls her a bedmate, bed and slips a few soft, downy pillows under her head as though she were able to feel her. All right, thank you. You can stop there. <laughs> I, hope he's, I hope he's not expecting her to feed those birds. <laughs> Okay, so what has happened here to this sculptor? Yeah, he has created for himself a love object, right? But the problem, it's, you know, it's made of ivory. It can't reciprocate his affection. So he's giving it all of these presents. He's laying down on a bed with it, right? But it can't respond in any way, right? It's an inanimate object. Uh -huh. He says he kisses it and imagines that it kisses back. Yeah. Yeah. He soft flesh. He, he, mm -hmm. he caresses it, he imagines it in his head it's soft like flesh that he says he uh -huh. has a bruise. Yeah, and one other thing that makes this disturbing, right, is that the passage at the beginning of this, like, details are that Pygmalion's a misogynist, right? Mm -hmm. Pygmalion hates women. So the perfect woman for this guy can't is, yeah, exactly. One that can't respond to him in any way, right? Mm -hmm. She can neither resist nor respond. So, go ahead. She won't nag him. Well, she won't do it. She don't, won't do much yeah. of anything, right? Can we get a volunteer to keep going here? The holiday honoring Venus has come. Anybody? The holiday? Yeah, Larry, go for it. Sorry, you've already read. <laughs> Okay, just quick, quick pause there. Um, heifers are particularly important symbols in the text. Well, they're, they are cows, yes, but, yes, exactly. It's, a heifer is a cow that is not yet calved. Heifers were also the favored sacrificial animal in ancient Rome. So was virgin cow? Yep. That was part of it. Virgin cow. And this is one of the reasons why Io gets turned into a heifer, right? She's essentially Zeus's sacrificial animal. Go ahead, keep going, Larry. An incense, incense source. An incense source up in thick clouds. Having already brought his own gift to the altar, Pygmalion stood by and offered his faint-hearted prayer. If you in heaven are able to give us whatever we ask for, then I would like, as my wife, and not daring to say, my ivory maiden, said, one like my statue. Since Golden Venus was present there at her altar, she knew what he wanted to ask for. And as a good omen, three times the flame soared, and leapt right up to the heavens. Once home, he went straight to the room club of his sweetheart, threw himself down on the couch where he repeatedly kissed her. She seemed to grow warm, so he repeated the action, kissing her lips and exciting her breasts with both hands. Aroused the ivory softening, losing its stiffness, yielded. Submitting to his caress as wax softens its wings, warmed by the sun, and handled by fingers, takes on many forms, and by, you, by being used, becomes useful. Amazed, he rejoices, then doubts, then fears he's mistaken, while again and again he touches on what he has prayed for. She is alive, and her veins leap under his fingers. 
you believe that Pygmalion offered to God his, his thanks in a turn of speech, once again kissing those lips that were not untrue, that she felt his kisses, and timidly blushing, she opened her eyes to the sunlight. At the same time, first looked on her lover in heaven. The gods attended the wedding since she had arranged it. And before the night moon had, had come to his presence, a daughter was born to them, Paphos, who gave her own name to Adam. All right, thank you, Larry. So, <clears throat> the goddess Venus has rewarded Pygmalion's unnatural desire, right? She's given him what he wants. She's turned his ivory statue into a real woman that he can now marry. And they have a daughter, right? So from Pygmalion and statue. <laughs> right, comes this daughter, Paphos. And Paphos herself has a son, Cinerus, who himself as a daughter, Mira. I couldn't figure out that family connection. I was kind of lost. Uh-huh. But uh, let's say where she marries her or has sex with her grandfather. Well, with her father. Oh, with her father. Uh, yeah, not her grandfather. Oh, uh, yeah. Cinerus is Mira's father. So we see unnatural sexual desire replicated in the future generations. Right. Pygmalion's desire for an inappropriate object falls down on the head of his great-granddaughter, who, in a way, repeats her forebear's sin, which was aided and abetted by the goddess Venus. Right. So Mira sneaks into her father's bedchamber a couple of times, right, conceives a child, Right, this Adonis, who was born of a tree, right, unnatural birth, and becomes beloved of Venus. And then I think it's important to look at exactly what happens to Adonis at the end of his story. If we look on page 1115, Right, she's warned him not to go hunting against, you know, the fierce wild creatures like boars, right, because they're all dangerous and shit. Right, so, and after warning him, she went off on her journey, carried aloft by her swans, but his courage resisted her admonitions. It happened that as his dogs followed a boar they were tracking, they roused it from where it was hidden, and when it attempted to rush from the forest, Adonis pierced it but lightly, casting his spear from an angle. With its long snout, it turned and knocked loose the weapon, stained with its own blood, then bore down on our hero, and as he attempted to flee for his life in sheer terror, it sank its tusks deep into the young fellow's privates and stretched him out on the yellow sands where he lay dying. So what's important here, given the chain that we've been discussing, is not just that the boar kills Adonis, but how it kills him. What does it do to him? Yeah, castrates him essentially, right? It gores its tusks into his, uh, into his privates. So what this does, right, is put a definitive end to this line of people who should not have been. Right, this line of people born from an object, this line of people born from inanimate matter. And ultimately, this is a rebuke to the goddess Venus herself. She made it happen, right? She gave Pygmalion the thing he wanted but shouldn't have had. And takes the fruit of it for herself a few generations later. And we get a lot of this kind of uh, sort of language about gods toying with and abusing mortals for their own pleasures, right, throughout 
the epic. And I think that, you know, a lot of people, like, the usual explanation for Ovid's exile, right, and, you know, just to explain a little bit about the exile generally, right, the place where he was sent to, Toms, um, is, it's, what, it's in what is now Romania. Um, he was absolutely miserable there. To a sophisticated Roman, um, this was like, um, you know, this, this was, you know, just being sent to live among barbarians, right? It's like, there are all of these hairy people here who dress in furs and don't perfume their bodies. They don't bathe. Like, what the hell is this place? Like, imagine, like, you spent your whole life in San Francisco, and then suddenly you're moved to, like, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, right? Our first line of defense against Canada. Um, and, like, you're in this rural environment that's completely unfamiliar. The people's habits are strange to you. Everybody around you sort of looks like a rube to you, right? That's what things were like for Ovid, or at least how he expressed his attitudes towards the place. And I would argue that it was more likely the metamorphoses that got him exiled than the Ars Amatoria. He stuck around in Rome for several years after the Ars Amatoria first appeared. Yeah, but it was still, so, like, people didn't uh, publish poems quite the same way. We, like, it, there wouldn't be, like, an editor who would sort of take it up and, you know, release a book. Usually these would be circulated as the poet was working on them among his friends and his patrons and, um, you know, what have you. So news of this poem and its contents certainly would have gotten back to the emperor and his circle while Ovid was working on it. And I think that this poem, with its irreverence um, and the fact that, you know, the way that it mocks the very idea of stability, which was exactly what Augustus was trying to promote, I think that that's probably what really got him into trouble. And Mark is a dangerous person. All right, so next time, we are finally leaving the marble precincts of... Greece and Rome, and we're going to be looking at um, a portion of an ancient Indian epic. We're going to be reading uh, some selections from the Bhagavad Gita, so I have some reading questions for you. Um, I will return your last reading quiz to you, and yeah, like I said, um, way better this time, guys. I was uh, really impressed with the level of improvements. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again to our presentation group. Good job, guys.